Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much for allowing me the opportunity to present. I'm super excited. My name is Dr. Carrie Thurman. I am a staff surgeon at the University of Kansas Medical Center in Kansas City, Kansas. Um, work with the Department of Urology there. Um, I trained at the University of Iowa and then came straight out of residency here as a general urologist. Um, I worked with Dr. Lori, Lori Lerner to start doing a laser prostate surgery and began doing homeum laser enucleations about four years ago. And in building that practice, um, I also saw a lot of voiding dysfunction and um, really got interested in sacral neuromodulation. I trained with Dr. Carl Kreider um, at the University of Iowa, so had done a lot of interstim placements, and then um, worked with Dr. Siegel um, at the beginning of my career to really uh, get my placement down. And so here, our residents um, really struggled with accurate placement, how to get it right, um, ways and techniques to work with fluoroscopy to get it right, and then also programming. So I'd like to talk to you today about quick indications, um, how to place these, um, troubleshooting, and then uh, my Medtronic rep, Peyton, is gonna go over very simple programming steps because it always occurs on the weekend that the MRI room's calling you with an interstim that needs to be turned off. And I know that can cause a lot of anxiety for everyone. So we'll go ahead and get started. So this technology was actually developed in the 1980s. So this is not new. And in 1999, um, it got the FDA approval for overactive bladder and urinary retention. So um, definitely been around. Uh, back in the day, they used to cut all the way down to the bone temp, uh, to the bone plate to place these. And luckily, we don't have to do that anymore. Indications, frequency, urgency, urge incontinence, urinary retention, and also fecal incontinence. So how do these things work? And patients always ask, how is this working? And I usually say it keeps the hot things hot and the cold things cold. And patients really understand that. But what we're doing is stimulating the somatic afferent nerves in the spinal cord, which sends signals to the CNS that may restore normal bladder function. So activation of these somatic afferents inhibits bladder sensory pathways and reflex bladder hyperactivity artificially producing action potentials and modulates abnormal sensory input from the bladder to the brain. So I always tell patients it brings back that brain-bladder connection, okay? So interestingly, if this affected efferent pathways, this would work more like an artificial sphincter. When it's on, I hold urine, and to pee, I have to turn it off. And as we know, we don't have to do that because it affects afferent chains, not efferent. So really an, an amazing technology. So innervation of the lower urinary tract. Um, so sympathetic is storage or feeling. So sympathetic storage. Parasympathetic is voiding, emptying. And then the somatic is filling because you're keeping that sphincter tight. So this is a really important slide to remember for your boards and in-service. There are lots of questions regarding this. So your sympathetic is going to be in your thoracic spine via the hypogastric nerves, and that's going to help you store urine. Your pelvic nerves are going to be your parasympathetic S234, and they help you empty. And then the pudendal nerves are your somatic, also an S234, and they keep those pelvic muscles tight. So guarding reflex promotes filling, voiding reflex activates parasympathetic, inhibits sympathetic. Very important to remember. Here are our neurotransmitters. So muscarinic receptors um, are cholinergic, are adrenergic, are alpha and beta. As we know, we've got alpha along the bladder neck, or uh, beta along your bladder neck. Here is the distribution of your muscarinic nicotinic receptors. So you've got your muscarinic and your beta in your detrusor muscle. Remember our beta-3 agonist is our merbetric, okay? A lot of alpha receptors um, along the trigone and bladder neck, where you would have Flomax work, for instance. 
And here is sympathetic and somatic innervation and receptors. Okay, so here we are with that hypogastric nerve. We're inhibiting the parasympathetic here so we can store. Okay, so patient selection. Refractory urgency frequency syndrome and or urge incontinence. So failure res to respond to behavioral treatments like lifestyle modifications, bladder retraining and pelvic floor physical therapy, failure of pharmacotherapy, and more than one anti-muscarinic or beta-3 agonist for four weeks. So oftentimes in my practice, I start the medication and I see them back fairly quickly. So I'll go ahead and give them two prescriptions, a referral to pelvic floor, and I'll see them back in six to eight weeks. And at that point, um, we will definitely discuss third line therapy. Um, another patient selection, you can have chronic urinary retention. Um, so this is no anatomical evidence of obstruction. And I've made this mistake in the past. If patients are obstructed, this therapy will not work. And it's very frustrating to both the patient and you. So off-label patients, interstitial cystitis, chronic pelvic pain, and neurogenic bladder. So these are not FDA approved indications. I will tell you, I put a lot of interstims in for chronic pelvic pain that is refractory um, to all other uh, modalities. And it works really, really well. If a patient need, needs an MRI, they're not a good candidate for this treatment at this time, okay? So we do have an MRI lead coming out soon, and many of you may have seen, um, you know, new therapies such as Exonix, which is approved um, for MRI. So we're starting to cross that, cross that barrier for this treatment, which is really exciting. Okay, so one of the most important things to take with you from today is how to effectively counsel these patients. Because if you call, if you tell patients, you're gonna, we're gonna be in your spinal cord, you're gonna have two big incisions in your back, no one's gonna be excited for this treatment. So what has really helped me in my counseling is using these types of pathways to counsel my patients. So they can see the pathway, um, they can see where they are along the pathway, and they take this home with them, and it really is helpful um, in how you counsel your patients. And here is kind of my male pathway. So I would um, definitely develop these for yourself um, as you move forward. And I got these from Dr. Steve Siegel at Metro Urology in Minnesota. Okay, so let's talk about you've signed the patient up, and now what do you need to think about? So for stage one, you always need fluoroscopy a minor surgery set, electrocautery, the actual implants, and the test stimulator. Your rep um, for whatever company you're using should be there, and that is gonna help you place the lead and test it appropriately. For stage two implant, no fluoroscopy is needed, okay? Minor surgery set, electrocautery, you need the actual neuromodulator, patient programmer, and clinician programmer. Okay, your rep should also be there for your stage twos. So patient preparation. I typically do monitored anesthesia care on all these patients. If you have a deep MAC, this works perfectly. Patients do very well. They don't feel a thing. Typically, I guess things that have changed since I started training. We would keep patients pretty light and we'd ask them where they would feel the stimulation because you're looking for anywhere along the bicycle seat. Now, I just rely solely on fluoroscopic guidance and their motor responses. So we keep patients very deep and we don't talk to them at all, and patients do great. If you need to do general anesthesia, oh, some patients aren't as healthy in that prone position, anesthesia may be worried, make sure you do not use long-acting paralytics. So no rocuronium, succinylcholine ole, if you use rock, your anesthesiologist will say, oh, no big deal, we'll reverse them. The pelvic muscles do not reverse easily. Okay, so to reverse a pelvic muscle that's paralyzed takes days. So you may not see responses, and that can be really frustrating. So for pre-op antibiotics, I use vancomycin and gentamicin because these are implants. 
Um, so that's my personal preference. Um, positioning will be prone. Positioning is the most important part of the case. So we all want to be there for patient positioning. Okay, so residents, staff, we're all there, we're working together. You really want to put a pillow under the abdomen to flatten the sacrum. And we get a lot of very um, interesting anatomy with kyphosis, et cetera. If you don't appropriately pace, play, uh, position these patients, it's very hard to place these. So super important. Feet are exposed. I always have the C-arm on the patient's right side. So for draping, I use 10 tin drapes first over the anus. And that's to keep everything very sterile. I towel off widely, okay, because you want access to the whole sacrum as well as the glute so you can place um, the pocket for the battery. I then put Iaban over the whole field so nothing touches skin, okay. Laparotomy drape, electrocautery suction. I put an extra drape on the patient's left side with a weighted ring forcep for the C arm. That way, when the C arm goes from AP to lateral, easily covers. Um, all uh, aspects of the C-arm and you're not messing around with, you know, contamination during the case or getting extra drapes. Okay, so the goals of the lead implant, and if we all keep these goals in mind, um, we can get a good implant, a good response, and the patient has a great, um, a great, great uh, response as well and is very happy. So you want the lead to track the natural nerve path. Okay, so here's the nerve coming out of S3 and a visualization of exactly how we want the lead coming through S3 going right along that nerve. My biggest goal is that I want four out of four electrodes to test at less than two milliamps, okay? Even one or less, but if we can get all four at less than two, that's fantastic. And you want appropriate motor responses observed. So you want the bellowing, of um, the glutes, and then you want the toe. So surgical steps. So first, we're gonna identify the sacrum and the S3 foramen is what we wanna do. So here you'll see an AP view, sacrum, and we always talk about the thumbprints here being S1, S2, S3, 5, Number five here is the sciatic notches. So this picture, you always want a nice clear view to start and this really guides your placement. Okay, so there are three ways that we can identify the S3 foramen. And I use, have used all three ways in my training and I'll tell you the way that I um, am most successful. So the first um, is identifying the sciatic notches and a draw a line connecting them. So this is the crosshairs technique. So your needle entry point is two centimeters cephalad to this line and two centimeters lateral to midline. So I can use a finger and go two centimeters over, two centimeters up from this crosshairs technique. Method two, identify the coccyx, measure up nine centimeters from the tip of the coccyx, two centimeters over, two centimeters up, okay? Another way to identify S3. So these are all ways um, that can be successful. So my preferred way is to use fluoroscopy only. I'm not using any measuring. I'm using only the C-arm to get where I need. So we take this view again. The first AP view, all we're doing is marking the medial edges of the sacrum. So take a shot and you can mark medial edges all along this area and mark that out, okay? At this point, we are not identifying S3, just medial aspects. Then we'll go lateral and we'll identify lateral landmarks, okay? So you need a good lateral view of the whole sacrum, okay? And you can kind of see S1, S2, S3, S4. So there are three ways we can identify S3 from this lateral view. The first is the midpoint between the sacral promontory and the tip of the coccyx. If you just measure halfway, that will give you S3. The second way is to follow the iliac crest. OK, 
Okay, the iliac shadow here will take you straight to S3. And then finally, the third way to identify S3 in the lateral view is the prominent hillock. And you can see right there is that seam for S3. Okay, so number one, we mark medial aspects of the sacrum. Number two, we identify S3 in the lateral um, position with using our three different ways to do that. Okay, so form and needle placement. We place the needle in the lateral view. So you're gonna use a snap or an other instrument to identify the skin entry point. And this has changed the way I place um, these inner stems and has really been beneficial to me. So I wanna be able to see the skin edge when I take the lateral view and I'm gonna put my snap right here so I can actually see it when I take a shot, mark that area, and I know this is exactly my needle entry point. So that's really helpful. The needle entry point you want parallel to the S3 bone seam and one centimeter cephalad to the S3 bone seam, okay? Um, you also want this high and medial in S3. So if you're ever confused, go higher and more medial. So once we place the needle, we're going to test our placement and we wanna test at the anterior sacrum. So we do not wanna be down in here testing. We want just right past the bones, um, the bone plate. We'll start testing at a low amplitude. So we'll start 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, and we're aiming for less than two. You wanna avoid trolling. It's okay to move your needle entry point in a minute, out a minute, but do not be pushing in and out in big ways. Um, that's dangerous and it's not gonna help you with the placement. Okay, so now we're gonna look for motor and sensory responses. You need to know all the responses. So S3, bellows of the perineum, plantar friction, toe, pulling in the rectum, or scrotum labia clitoris. Okay, and you're not gonna get sensations here because I rarely wake them up. S2, this is a must identify. If you're getting into S2, you really need to know that. I have implanted an S2 before accidentally and patients are miserable um, and they will never wanna try this therapy again because it's very painful. So you'll actually see a glute, a very big glute, um, ipsilateral uh, contraction, and you'll see heel rotation and calf, okay? And your rep will say, oh, I'm getting calf or heel. And that's a good um, sign that you're in S2. S4 is bellows only. So you'll never get that toe. You'll just get the bellows. So the angle of the needle is very, very important because once you place the needle, you're floating that lead. So you need to be able to visualize that. So if you can see the red, it's in S3, it looks great, but you can see as we float that lead, we may hit S2, okay? The blue needle is where we wanna be, all right? That way our lead will float right along the nerve, okay? So it's really difficult at first to kind of figure out what we need to do on the skin to make it look right on the bone table. But as you go, you'll be able to get better at this process. So we want a medial to lateral trajectory, okay? And then we want electrodes two and three to straddle the anterior margin of the sacrum. Now, troubleshooting for me, um, when I first began placing a lot of inner stems, I used to get a little aggressive with pushing this um, lead in too much. It worked great for my responses, but if I ever needed to remove the lead for impedance issues, lead breakage, patient needing an MRI, the deeper this is, the harder it is to remove. So now I'm very cognizant to try and keep um, electrode three really um, straddling that table so I can get these out if I need to. All right, so I always 
place the lee or place the um, form and needle, we get good responses. And then I always come up and do an AP view before we float. Because many times you will be medial to lateral trajectory or even the other way. It still, you're getting fine responses when you're testing the form and needle. When you float, you'll be way off. Okay, so you really want to be in this nice parallel position to the sacrum. Again, here you'll see the lateral to medial, and you see here visually lateral to medial, but your nerve goes right here. If you place this lead, you will have about one program that will work, okay, right here. Every other program will be way too far away from that nerve. So this is a good way to think about it. Um, so here again, red line is S2. So oftentimes if I place a foramen needle and we get S2 responses, I leave the needle there because that kind of is a visual that, okay, I know that's S2. I take a finger and I go one finger breadth below on the skin to then get S3. Okay, so remember S2 response, um, you're going to get that really big glute contraction, heel rotation, and calf, and it's very painful to the patient. All right, so needle entry point. So we've marked out everything with fluoroscopy, we've thought and visualized our needle placement, which is really important, and now we will mark the skin with a wheel of local lidocaine. I don't go any deeper than skin. The foramen needle, we want at a 60 degree angle. And we want to be high and medial in the S3 foramen. Okay. Once we're in, we will test responses. So needle needs to move anterior to the surface of the bone. We want to see bellows followed by toe at two or less. Okay. So we call that a low opening threshold. Step four, once we get a good placement with our foramen needle, we will float the lead. So make a stab incision along the foramen needle, remove the inner stylet, okay, and we're going to replace um, this with a long directional guide, okay. So the directional guide has um, markers on it for 3.5 centimeters as well as 5 centimeter depending on if you're using a long form in needle. So always assure you know you're using the 3.5 if that's appropriate and then put the directional guide in to the appropriate depth. Then you're going to pass the introducer sheath, okay? So if you want to think of this like a laparoscopic port, it's a way to float the lead. So this is a super important part of the case. I cannot stress how important this is. So there will be a radio-opaque marker at the base of this. You want that radio-opaque marker halfway along the bone table. If you push this in too far, you can create a false tract. If you don't push it in far enough, you won't break through the bone table to allow um, the lead to float. And this radio-opaque marker here we call the launch point, okay? So I would much rather you not place it deep enough than too deep. So I, flora I do a lot of fluoroscopy during this part. I don't go live, but I just take shots intermittently. Okay, so once we get our launch point ready, we will place the tined lead. So here are the tines. Those tines are going to deploy in the bone table. Okay, and here's your lead. Zero is furthest proximal. One, two, and three should be on the anterior surface of the bone table. Okay. So for this part, I use the curved stylet, and this has aided me in great placement. So instead of using the straight stylet, I load the curved into the lead. We do this under continuous fluoroscopy. So I'll put the lead in to the first white marker and then we'll go live and we aim down and out. So um, we will aim towards 
um, kind of usually when my rep is facing me, I say aim towards her right shoulder, okay? And you wanna think of this like placing or throwing a dart, a smooth and continuous motion, and you're gonna stop when electrodes two and three straddle the anterior bone edge, very important. And then once the lead is in position, we're gonna test all four electrodes, zero, one, two, three, and I say zero, zero, zero the whole time I'm testing, one, 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 and then Peyton will call out um, what responses I'm getting. And we want everything two or less. Another really important part is getting um, the stylet out, okay? So, and the introducer sheath out. So we do this under live fluoroscopy as well. We wanna keep our lead in place while pulling out the stylet and um, the introducer. And this can be very difficult at first and things can move around a lot. Um, so, you know, this is kind of where things deploy. So we really wanna take care at this part. If you're ever worried that things moved around a lot, just test the leads again. Okay, so once the patient's um, implanted, they go home, um, and I personally test for two weeks. I used to test for one, and that caused a lot of trouble in terms of patients saying, I don't know if it's working, we have to reprogram, and so I was moving things around a lot. So two weeks, I do seven days of oral antibiotics, usually we do Keflex, a bladder diary, and we're looking for a 50% improvement, and then you need to let patients know that they cannot fully submerge themselves in a bath or shower, they need to sponge bath. Um, and then the implant phase, they get a single dose of perioperative antibiotics. We put in the battery, we program, and then they follow up in two to three weeks, but no antibiotics go home with them in that phase. Here is a great study that was um, published in the Journal of Urology in 2018, looking at five-year follow-up of sacral neuromodulation from this large working group. Um, and so this was great data. It showed an 80% implant rate, so going from stage one to stage two, an 80% rate of implant, 82% success rate at five years, which is amazing. So that's the 50% or greater improvement at five years, 45% with complete continence at five years, 84% of subjects reported improved quality of life. You will notice a 22% adverse event rate, meaning undesirable stimulation, implant site pain, or therapeutic ineffectiveness. 30.9% surgical intervention rate at five years, so revision replacement explant. And 33% had a battery replacement. So revision of these implants is real and needs to be discussed with the patient. The hope is with the new device that is rechargeable, we can really decrease the revision rate. Okay, so Peyton, I'm gonna go ahead and give this over to you so you can talk about programming. Perfect, great. So um, I'll have you click for me and you can go no ahead. Um, um, just wanted to reiterate first what Dr. Thurman was saying, your programming and the visits that um, your patients have postoperatively are strictly going to correlate with your lead placement. Um, and we'll talk about how programming works, you can go ahead, um, what to expect with our different programmers, you can keep going. And one more, so when it comes to programming, I wanted to first kind of cover what defines um, stimulation. Um, electrical current is designed with Ohm's law in mind, and batteries can be designed with either current or voltage. They, they, you know, according to Ohm's law, both are utilized ultimately, but battery design can be different. Um, I just wanted to point out that while one can be designed with one, um, it doesn't have anything to do with the actual nerve activation. Um, what defines stimulation is amplitude and your pulse width. Um, and that, you know, correlates with how well your lead is placed. So amplitude is the intensity of the stimulation. Um, there are other parameters that go into stimulation, such as rate, 
Um, but pulse width is the area that's being stimulated that also can affect intensity as well. Um, Medtronic over the years has done a ton of research, you can keep clicking, um, over what is efficient for both patient stimulation and battery function. So your amplitude, um, you know, is just determined by your lead placement, but pulse width, um, all other advanced settings, as well as now programs, are standardized to make it simpler on you guys in office. Um, we want this to be an efficient process. Um, prior to our standardization, it was just kind of willy-nilly. We would pick out a program and hope for the best. Um, but now there actually is a process to it where we know we're stimulating different parts of the lead in hopes to get closer to where the nerve is. Ideally, we want our, our lead to be parallel and close to the nerve, the S3 nerve, but, you know, realistically, sometimes you're going to have that lead in certain places further away from the nerve than maybe where you would like. You still might get, you know, a good response, but your amplitude might be a little bit higher, which can drain the battery a little bit faster. At the end of the day, it's your symptom relief that matters for the patient. Um, but let's say down at the distal end, you've got an electrode or two that's a little bit further away from where the S3 nerve is. Um, that is reflected um, here where on program one and two where these um, distal electrodes are circled. That's actually where our energy is emitted. So of course we need the positive and negative, but the negative is, is what's being utilized on the lead. So if we're having issues or um, higher amplitudes with programs one and um, two, we could look at maybe going three or four to move up more proximal on the lead to activate the nerve better. So the, this is just a picture of what our standard programs are. This will be helpful later when we look at our programmers, um, but this is really helpful to know if you're programming patients in your office. So, um, Wanted to start by going over our legacy products first. Um, any patient that's pretty much prior 2019 and prior, or in other words, most of your patients will have an ICON programmer. This is a patient programmer that's assigned to every single patient with an implant. We'll go over what those functions are, but if you want to interrogate the device further, and we'll talk about what that means, you'll need access to this clinician programmer. Um, and if you'll click over to the next one, we'll start with the clinician programmer. I'm not going to get too into the weeds on what button to press when, but just know once you get it powered on, you really want the patient's programmer brought in office um, during their visit because then you can see what their programs actually are in their remote, meaning what negative is being utilized and also what programs they've been on how long. So it can kind of give you a percentage of, of what they've been using and if they actually have changed their programs or not. So go ahead to the next screen. Um, once you get synced in is what we called it or where the um, ICON programmer is paired to your, your clinician programmer, we wanna work through the tabs left to right. So keep clicking, might even be on the next slide. Yep, this is just simple troubleshooting, but this gives a good picture of what the tabs look like. So when you first get in, number one, you're gonna see that the inner stem is on, indicated by the little um, button up here. So if you're looking for a patient um, to, to get their device turned off for a scan of some kind or radiology contacts you, you just wanna get in so you can click that button to turn it off. You can click it right back again to turn it back on. So that's a simple way to look at if the battery is on and off, and you can see this button on every tab moving forward. Um, but if you look towards the top, um, we're on the first page here. If you click on the second page, you'll see an actual breakdown of what the programs look like. So this program one that's highlighted here, you'll see there's a plus three minus zero. That means we're utilizing the most distal electrode. Um, you can change the advanced settings um, on the bottom right here, um, but our amplitude is at 1.0, and you can see what the other programs that the patient has access to, what that looks like. Um, with our legacy products, only four of our standard programs can be uploaded at a time. 
Um, but if you wanted to interrogate the device further, meaning check impedances or battery expectancy, um, then we want to click on the third tab. So if we go to the next slide. This is what that looks like. And it's important to know, um, especially if your patients have had complaints about, um, you know, they've had a fall and they've started feeling a weird shocking sensation. You might hear that a lot. Um, it could be because our, we have a miscommunication at some point during that lead or maybe even a fracture. This can measure that and give us a look at, at what that actually means. Um, impedance is measuring the resistance, which is a part of Ohm's law as well. So when you're measuring these impedance, it'll, it'll pre-populate the amplitude and pulse width and actually give you a measurement in ohms of the resistance between each electrode combination. So when you press the impedance test button in about a minute, you'll have a reading of all of the connections, what the impedance reading is, we're looking for it to be greater than 50 ohms and, and less than 4,000. If it's within that range, you won't have any combinations highlighted, just like this picture shows. However, if you do have an impedance that's, that's out of that range specified, then it will highlight black. So it'll notify you, hey, this impedance is off. It could be for numerous reasons, but if you look and you notice that your um, impedances that are highlighted have a common electrode, um, then we want to avoid that in their programming. Um, so I kind of gave a, a couple more pictures of our programs. This first picture of the lead is our program one, utilizing our electrode zero. So let's say on your impedances, you notice that every combination with a zero in it is highlighted. We wouldn't want to use a program like program one. Um, this is an example of program three here where we're utilizing electrode two because it counts zero, one, two, three. Um, this would be a more appropriate program for that patient if that was the case. Also on the screen, we can check battery life. So below where it says therapy measurements, um, you can click that and in about a minute as well, it'll give you not only a percentage capacity, but also expected longevity in months written out. So you can anticipate when that replacement might need to be scheduled before your symptom has complete or before your patient has complete symptom return. Um, I want to point out to you that when you have a patient with a device in, it's very easy when, when you hear complaints from them, especially when they're saying, you know, this isn't working, it's easy to jump straight to the device. But I want to remind you guys to keep in mind the patient's history and everything as a whole, because there's lots of other things that can affect their symptom return. So it's always important to roll out everything else before we jump to the device and start reprogramming. But it can be helpful, especially if they've had falls or trauma to measure the impedances to see if there really is something going on with the resistance in the device. In that case, definitely reprogram. You can go to the next slide. Um, this is, we're gonna go over just what the patient Icon programmer um, is very simple. This is not something that they have to keep with them all the time. Um, we do want them to bring it um, if they have a procedure going on because they actually can turn the device on and off themselves without having to come into the office. Um, where it, you know, you might have to access the clinician programmer to turn it off in a facility is if the patient forgot to bring in their remote. Um, so they can turn the battery on and off. They can adjust the amplitude up or down. Um, and that's always my first recommendation. If we've rolled everything out and they're still having issues, we can always try increasing the strength um, that might be needed to reach the nerve more effectively. Um, after every change, we wanna let the patient leave that new setting there for an extended period of time, a few days to a week even. So we can see if that change made a difference for them. If it hasn't, then the patient can change programs and you have total access to upload what those programs are in their remote. But once uploaded, that patient can shift between one, programs one through four on their own to help prevent, hopefully help prevent more office visits um, and more control for the patient. Um, we've done tons of research and have upgraded our programmers tremendously. Before, we didn't even have a screen where you could see where we are, what amplitude you were at. 
but we want the amplitude to be as low as possible. So I never encourage patients just to continue increasing if they are um, having issues and symptom return. Um, so once they've already tried increasing the amplitude, we encourage them just to go on to the next program so we're activating a different spot on the nerve. So you can go on to the next screen. This just goes over the specific buttons and how to make those changes we talked about. Um, we've now upgraded to our smart programmer. So we actually give them a Samsung device with apps loaded on there. So that way if they have forgotten their um, programmer, you can access their device um, with your own programmer. Um, every programmer, whether it's the patient's or yours, has the same apps on there. Um, it makes it more universal, a lot more intuitive to use. Um, instead of the corded antenna that you saw with the ICON programmer, we now have a Bluetooth um, antenna called the communicator. And this just kind of briefly goes over the steps with how to get the communicator turned on. Um, the apps actually walk you through how to do that as well in case the patient has forgotten. Um, but then once the patient gets into their app, which is called My Therapy, you can go on to the next slide. They have access to basically the same function. They can turn their device on and off. They can increase or decrease their amplitude. And they can also change the programs. However, with our smart device, instead of just having four programs loaded, we've pre-populated all seven standard programs that they can choose between. So they have access to all seven, unless you as a clinician has hit certain programs for impedance reasons or whatnot. So you can go to the next slide. We'll talk a little bit about the um, clinician app, which takes place of the big clinician 8840 programmer that we discussed earlier. It is password protected. The password is universal. So whether it's on the patient remote or yours, all clinician passwords are the same. Um, it'll have you connect the communicator just as we discussed before and it'll walk you through those steps as well. And then take you to the screen you see here on the right where you can either check impedances immediately, which is what we do when we're um, dropping the battery in the second stage um, of this device, but you can configure implant and it'll actually show you the pre-populated program so you're not having to click on the positive and negatives to design your own basically. Um, this just goes through, um, I just wanted you to get you guys to at least get a visual of what that looks like. Um, there's a link as well here at the bottom that go, has a smart programmer and programming training as well as other fundamentals and um, different courses you can sign up for yourself. So if you want to follow this link, create your own login information. Um, there's lots of good resources there at that website as well if you want to learn more about the therapy. So I hope you found this resourceful and I highly recommend reaching out to your local representative as well to get some hands-on experience so you can see what that looks like in office. Thanks, Peyton. Mm -hmm. All right, everyone, that ends the presentation. Um, please, if you have any questions, we can take those now. And um, again, um, this therapy can be so life-changing for so many people. Important to have your counseling track down. And then the more you do these, the more comfortable you feel, the more excited you're about them when you talk to the patient. And then they really want to pursue this therapy. And um, the better the placement, the easier the programming, and so, you know, in clinic, this isn't like, oh God, here we go again. It's not working, it's not working. You know, um, so it, it is very satisfying part of my practice and I really enjoy um, helping these patients. It's so satisfying. Okay, it doesn't look like there's any questions. So um, we will go ahead and end. Please give us feedback um, and I hope we'll be able to give this lecture again in the future. Thank you guys so much. Thank you.